Welcome back to another weekly Ask GMBN Tech. This is our Q&A session. You know the drill, or actually perhaps you haven't watched the show before, in which case we're going to tell you stuff about mountain bikes that our lovely viewers have asked us in the comments underneath. So if you've got any questions in relation to your bike, it could be about setting up tubeless, it could be about how to make your wheel true and go round. Uh, anything goes, get your questions in the comments underneath, use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and we'll put you on the show if it's a good question. Okay, first up is from Blanders123 this week. He says, why is the air in the front suspension fork only go in one side and not in both? Okay, well, let's get back to the beginning for a minute here. So early suspension forks, some of them used air, some of them used coil springs, but all of them to start with had air in both or coil in both. So the spring mechanism was in both legs. And then that meant there wasn't that much room for the damping mechanism of the forks which was quite often very small and very inconsistent because of the sizing with it. Now, I actually made a video fairly recently with a, I think it was a 1998 fork from RockShox called the Sid, and I took it and I basically took it apart and had a little look at how it worked in comparison to a brand new fork. I used a Fox 34 by comparison because they have similar amounts of travel, uh, similar intentions. Now, on the inside of that fork, it didn't have air, it actually had coil springs, but the coil springs were absolutely teeny on this thing compared to the modern equivalent. So I showed you in that video, the example of a regular or a modern core spring, which takes up the entire leg and they are massive by comparison, yet not that much heavier. So it's all about consistency. So structurally, it doesn't do anything by having damping in one leg and air in the other leg, and you only get the benefit of giving more space to each system. So you think on a modern air fork, you have both a negative and a positive chamber, Giving it as much space as possible means you can tune the air volume within that. So you actually get a better air spring than you would if you're forcing it into two different spaces, which arguably would be a lot smaller and less tunable. Now the same applies with the damper mechanism, depending on the style that's in a particular fork that you might be looking at. A lot of them now have a cartridge design like this one that I took out of that Fox 34, uh, which has a bladder at the top which expands and contracts. Now as she has oil on the inside of there, that particular one actually was a lightweight option. Uh, they're slightly bigger and have more oil inside, they're bigger in every way in other forks. That one was very slim down, yet it was giant by comparison compared to the damper unit that was in the other fork. So essentially it's down to consistency and behavior to get you the best possible fork. Now this is actually a long way around of telling you why it's so impressive that Cannondale managed to make the lefty perform the way it does because it's got everything crammed into a single leg, uh, not even two legs. It's got a single leg fork, it's got an air spring in it and it has the damper. That is incredibly hard to achieve, which is why not many people bother doing that. And that's kind of why I love Cannondale and it's also a reason why a lot of people frown on that fork. But um, hopefully that's an answer to your question. Okay, so uh, next question or a statement in fact actually is from Todd E. Doddy, your bike cave is amazing. I think it's one of the nicest examples of a bike cave and the best looking set of all the shows that your company hosts. Uh, love your show. Uh, well, thank you, Todd. Um, going backwards here, actually, uh, this is only, I'm only filming from here because of the, basically the pandemic restrictions that have been placed on the company. Now we are allowed to film back at work now and we actually have brand new studios. So expect things to change very soon. In fact, at literally the afternoon of me recording this, as I'm talking to camera, I'm actually going into the new set to start dressing it to make it look really cool. It's gonna look better than this place, that's for sure. Um, but I actually built this um, long before I started at GMBN. I was working on a on a website. Before that, I was working as a journalist for a magazine. Uh, in fact, if, if you can see it, the magazine is up there on the wall. I used to work for that for many years. And as a result, I've always been into taking photos and working on bikes in my own time. Uh, and I don't mean just getting a bike ready to work. I want a work surface so I could prepare things or so I could analyze things, you know, maybe take a fork apart, see what's different from that model to the previous year model. Uh, it's always been part of my workflow. So actually when I got the job at GMBN, it became pretty easy for me to sort of convert this to what I thought might look quite good if I ever had to use it. And actually, it came in really handy when lockdown happened. Uh, now, I know a lot of the other presenters struggled at first because we were all caught unaware, and I just so happened to have this space that I've been super fortunate to have uh, to work in. Um, and, but I think actually everyone else has done a better job because I kind of already had this and they had to adapt on the fly. I love recording stuff in here. I love hanging out in here, to be honest. Sometimes I just come in here and have a beer. I mean, my kitchen is right behind where the camera is. It's part of the house. 
this is inside my house so um, to have this place is really cool kind of makes me want to have a beer now actually except it's um, a quarter to three should probably focus on work eh? okay so next up is from um, Evan Huang Doddy, should we grease the threads of an Allen bolt? If so, how often? Okay, well firstly, generally yes. Um, secondly, well, how often? Well, when they need grease. It's not like a moving part. So threads on a bolt are designed to basically help the help the bolt tighten and loosen afterwards. So if you don't put them in, uh, you don't put any grease on the threads, they could bind. So you should see some shots of uh, me, I think, applying some grease onto threads here. So you want to be using grease on general bolts. You could use grease on all bolts on your bike, and that would be fine. However, we do recommend using some kind of thread lock, a blue thread lock that's medium strength. Uh, don't use the red ones generally, unless you don't want to see that bolt come out again, because uh, the blue ones are designed to be removable, but it's also a safety item. Now, you'd want to use thread lock on the sorts of bolts that could rattle loose. Now, things like uh, suspension hardware, sometimes those bolts are prone because of flexes and forces that go through certain frames. Some of them can unwind themselves. Now something else just to mention here is there's things like uh, copper compounds. I've got some floating around behind me somewhere. You might be able to see it, I can't see it at the moment. Now a copper compound, you want to use this in place of a grease in certain places on a bike. And the perfect example is if you're mixing different types of metal, in particular exotic metals like titanium, it doesn't play too well when you mix it with things like aluminium. So let's just say you've got a, a titanium frame, you're, you might be really lucky, and you're putting in an aluminium bottom bracket cup into the frame. Now, grease will be fine for this, but if you leave it in for an extended period of time, there is a chance that they can bind. They can almost corrode together, basically, so it can be really difficult to get them out. Now, the cool thing about using a copper-based compound here is it's a non-reactive metal. So even though this metals kind of want to react together and sort of bind together, it stops them. So it acts like a grease, but it's actually got a slightly different purpose. But really, you can get away with grease on almost all threads on the bike, uh, just don't go overboard. You need a small amount and it goes a long way. Uh, but it's good that you're asking about this because you should be using grease on bikes. I'm actually gonna put a link in the description underneath of a video all about different greases, thread locks, assembly compounds, and I kind of spell out the differences between all of them. Now, don't get me wrong, you don't need all of these things. Some of you will only need grease, and some of you will just wanna have everything under the sun. Like, that's totally cool. Uh, figure out what works best for you. Uh, and there's some recommendations and stuff in there as well. Okay. Next up is from Richard James Higgins. Hi Dolly, I have a 2006 Specialized Stump Jumper Expert and I want to fit a dropper post but I'm not sure what to get. I don't want to spend hundreds but I'm still looking for something reliable. I'm not sure if I should look at internal or external posts. The bottom of my seat post is open and not in the frame. So I thought I could run an internal under the frame with the brake. Yep, no problem at all. Okay, well, uh, yeah, it's, it's a minefield out there. So you've got to bear in mind that with something like a dropper post, typically what you what you pay for is what you get. So with the cheaper posts out there, they're not necessarily going to work any less, but they're going to be substantially heavier because they use cheaper materials. Um, but they might not last as long as well. But that said, that can actually work out for you okay as well. So at the upper end, one of the best you can get is the RockShox Reverb. So that's a hydraulic post. Now, the good thing about the reverb post, depending on which option that you went for, is the fact it's rebuildable. So you can buy all the parts for it, you can buy the spare parts internally, they can be serviced. They have service intervals, light suspension components. So yeah, I recommend those. Uh, and you could go for the external routing, or like you suggest, you could go for the internal, but make sure there's no chance of your tire buzzing on the way the hose comes out the bottom, because you can damage that. And that'll be the same on all designs. Uh, and of course, you don't want muck to get into the mechanism there as well, if you've got an open bottom of the frame there, because that could also get in the way of things. Uh, but as far as cheap options go, uh, something to say with the cheap ones, they're all gonna be cable operated, that's fine. Cables are cheap to replace. You can keep on top of the servicing with the cables by flushing out the housing, just like you would with the gears on your bike. Like I said, there's a lot of options out there. They've got a lot better. And yes, they're not all without their problems, but on the large part, most dropper posts are decent these days. Okay, next question is from Charlie Burnham. Doddy, I'm thinking about getting a coil shock on my Canyon Torque. I was looking at it and realized that the eye of the shock near the rear of the bikes turned 90 degrees from the front one. Also notice the coils on Fox's website don't have that. Is there an option to have the eyes turned or is there a way I can do it by myself? Um, it's quite simple, you literally turn the shaft. Uh, as you can see, you can move the move the shock basically to the orientation that you need it. Um, but more importantly in your case is that bike wasn't designed around a coil shock. 
So yes, you can fit one on there. Um, I've not put one on there, so don't quote me on this because you, you firstly need to make sure that the size of the shock doesn't interfere with the frame design. It doesn't hit anywhere. And that can happen quite often with core shocks on bikes that are designed around air shocks. Core shocks tend to be a bit bigger just in their physical size. So be very careful about that. Um, you might want to consult the warranty as well on it because on some brands they just don't they don't want you to change what they design a the bike around. That bike is designed around an air shock. It's got a fairly linear rear end. It's designed to be making the most of the, how progressive the air is, and you can change the volume on the air to get that feel. But that said, it's possible to get almost any coil shock to feel good on an air shock orientated bike design. Now it's not going to feel necessarily as good as stock so it will need some custom valving and it's quite incredible what those dedicated tuners can do there's enough of them around out there that can work their magic on bikes and also if that's still not quite enough and you're definitely keen to run a core shock and you want that nice progressive feel on the bike then you can get progressively wound coil springs as well yeah there's no reason why you can't put one on your bike except for if they physically cannot fit and it fails on frame if, if there's any danger of that Knock it off, mate. Um, air shocks can feel incredible. I'm a big fan. Okay, this one's also a response question, actually. Um, so in relation to the going from three by to two by question last week in my last show, um, I think I said, you know, if you want to go to one by, you know, you want to get a derailleur, you want to get a, der um, a cassette and stuff like this. I was basing this around the spread of gears. If you wanted to keep the same spread of gears as three by nine, the way to do it by one by nine is to increase everything at the back. So Jason Gunnick said, I disagree on the one by conversion requiring all parts. I converted my three by nine to one by nine on my Cannondale by simply replacing the middle ring up front with a race face narrow wide and remove the other chain rings, uh, remove the derailleur, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I didn't need to resize the chain even. Blah, 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 blah. Essentially rode this for years uh, before upgrading to a new bike and had no issues with dropping chains. Yeah, like I said, I wasn't talking about that. Um, it might have come across wrong, I forget. So um, give me a second on this. So I was merely saying that if you wanted to keep the same or a similar range of gears going from a three by to a two by or to one by, if you're going to one by, you're gonna to need to increase the range of gears on the back to try and bring some of that back. Yeah, of course, anyone that's got three by, the cheapest way to go one by is to just ditch two chain rings, ditch the front mate, ditch the shifter, uh, ideally get yourself a narrow wide on there and you'll be good to go. Um, if you can't get a narrow wide on there, you can just get a little chain guide on there. So that's actually what I did years ago. I was running a one by nine on my old Commercial Meta 5, then on the Meta 5.5, then on my Trek, I had a Trek Remedy, then on the next version of the Trek Remedy on several bikes I had. And I had to homemade, um, I had to home make chain guides. I was using MRP downhill guides and basically butchering the upper guide, just that bit on its own, which you're now seeing as guides in a smaller format. So I was doing that a long time ago and yeah, it worked. But the nine gears on the back with that single ring on the front might not be enough spread for, for the person who's asking the questions. I just wanted to say that, that of course you can do that, but that's not necessarily how I meant it. Uh, next up is from Miles underscore 8490. How do I make sure everything is working properly after a crash? Hey, this is a really good question. Um, I'm actually gonna make a video on this because I've seen a few things recently that have scared me. I actually saw someone who crashed his bike on a local ride and his brake hoses were, basically they were bent so much that they were crimped. And when they're crimped, basically you, you get problems with the hydraulic pressure. If you haven't got good hydraulic pressure in the system, you won't get proper power from your brakes. They feel really consistent, uh, inconsistent. But also more worryingly, that's gonna be a weak point in the line and at some point, you know when you bend some things, after a while you get fatigued and they'll snap, that will happen with your brake hoses. So first thing to do is a sense check. You know, assess what happened, check yourself, check your helmet. If you've bashed your head, really you should be replacing your helmet. Definitely consult the manual on that, but uh, don't take any chances with your helmet. That is the first thing you wanna check. Then of course, a sense check the bike. Is it in one piece? Is there anything clearly bent or broken? If so, then you've answered your own question but you're gonna to need to look in a bit more detail. So looking on screen, spin the wheels around, right? So if the bike looks good, but you wanna check it, spin the wheels, make sure nothing's rubbing or anything's buckled, see if any spokes are missing, see if the tires are bulging off the rim, anything like that. And obviously you're gonna to need to repair that as needed. Next up, the frame, look for dents. Um, Think about the type of crash you had. If it's one of those ones that uh, you just slammed on the floor, maybe your handlebars turned. It's one of those sort of crashes. Not a lot else, not a lot else happens. But if it's one of those ones you have a full yard sale catapult tomahawk type thing, and your bike ends up 50 meters down the trail in a tree, then yeah, you've probably got a dent or a ding somewhere, and that's exactly where stress rises and cracks and stuff can occur from. 
So look, areas to look really under and all around the head tube, you do not want the front of your bike separating. Look under the bottom bracket, look around welds in high stress areas, in particular your chain stage, your bottom bracket shell, and that junction at the bottom of the frame there where all your body weight is on, and the head tube at the front, we call the leverage from the fork. But you should be doing this from time to time anyway. I always do this when I wash a bike. I'll have go over it with a fine tooth comb, just make sure anything's good. And if there's stuff that's starting to look a bit knackered, that's a good opportunity it's just to write a note, like, you know, monitor that. You know, I did this on, say, 1st of November, um, and by 1st of December, it's got a crack. So time to knock it off. Uh, next up, controls. So check your handlebars are aligned. Make sure that your handlebars, of course, being a safety item too, they don't have any dings, creases, bends, stress marks on them. Look for telltale signs. If you're questioning it, then use your common sense, mate. Um, replace them or go to a bike shop if you're completely unsure about your analysis. You could send us a picture, but sometimes it's hard in a picture. Sometimes this sort of thing is better for someone to see in the flesh. Uh, check your brake levers. Make sure your brake levers themselves are still on. Uh, sometimes they can bend and you might be tempted to bend them back, but um, I've done that before and they've snapped off. So uh, you don't want it to happen on the trail when you're braking, when you need those brakes. Um, yeah, and brake hoses, like I said, any crimps in them will do that. But uh, I think we'll do a detailed video on this because actually it's a very valid video because the amount of crashing that you tend to happen in mountain biking, whether you're pushing your limits or you're just starting, it's gonna happen. And then of course, ones in the middle where it kind of catches you with your pants down where you're, yeah, I can ride a bike, all good, bang, on the floor, didn't know what happened. Um, so yeah, let's, let's definitely do that as a video. I think some solid questions in there. If anyone's got any questions about the questions on this show, uh, we'd love to know, get involved in the comments. If you've got any questions you'd like us to answer for a following show, use that hashtag ask GMN Tech. As always, you can ask us any questions you want about anything and um, we'll try and answer them. But um, thanks for hanging around. Don't forget to tune in to us um, for all our content. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed and uh, follow us on Instagram as well. See you later.